Do you want to start a business, get out of the office, achieve happiness and success while crushing life? This is Boss to Boss, the place to be for that extra motivation to get up and follow your dreams while learning from the ones who have already done it. And now for your host, Miro Wieslow. Welcome to Boss to Boss. Today's guest is known as the real life Wizard of Oz by Forbes and Entrepreneur Magazine. He has been friends and has worked with the likes of Sir Richard Branson, Elon Musk, and Sir Elton John. He's the founder of Bluefish, one of the top personal concierge services and an expert marketer within the luxury industry. Steve has been quoted in various publications and TV, including the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, London's Sunday Times, South China Morning Post, and many more. He's spoken at Harvard and at the Pentagon. And last but not least, he's helped people practically get up to the moon and visit uh, the Titanic, play a role in a real-life James Bond scene. I mean, you name it, get serenaded by Elton John. I can keep going on and on for days. But Steve Sims, I do not want to steal your thunder. How are you doing today? It's such a pleasure to have you on. (laughs) <laughs> well, it's kind of a cool little intro there, but uh, I'm cool, thanks. It's kind of a what? <laughs> it's a cool intro. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know what? Sometimes I don't want to steal your thunder. I just want to, you know, throw out a couple facts, a couple things, because now everybody's <laughs> like, okay, Wizard of Oz, Elon Musk, Steve Sims. I always thought it was Steve Sims before I actually found out it was Steve D. Sims, <laughs> which is probably a good way to remember it, too. Yeah, yeah, probably. And uh, for everybody, for everybody tuning in, everybody that's following along and wants to check out more of Steve and and see the face, connect the face to the name, make sure to check out stevedsims.com, or you can just go on Instagram, on Facebook, Steve D Sims, and uh, Twitter, uh, YouTube, pretty much uh, the same. And uh, yeah, I mean, they they say that that you're the ugliest bald man. That we uh, that we have ever met, right? There you go. Ugly is my <laughs> ugly is my first name. So wh- where did, where did that come from? Um, it, it came from two things. Uh, the way that I market, the way that I brand, the way that I get in front of people has always been very raw and has been very ugly. So there's mm-hmm. a lot of people that polish things. And I'm like, screw that. Let's just get it out there. So I'm all about the ugly war, the most impactful. And someone actually called me Ugly Sims because of the way I marketed to the most affluent people in the world. So it just stuck that I was known as Ugly Sims. And then I would literally introduce myself. And I went, hey, how you doing? My name's Steve. I'm Ugly Sims. And they were like, oh, you're not really ugly. And it was just an icebreaker. Because then um, everybody starts feeling bad for you, right? And they're like, oh. Yeah, I, I had to stop it because I don't really like any pity. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll be like, oh Christ, I thought it was funny, but then you get people going, oh, you're not really. And I'm thinking, I don't really care, you know, but, uh, they used to get all kind of like pitiful about it. So I had to stop it in the end. So more about blue fishing and kind of how you even got there. Do you want to give us mm-hmm. a quick little rundown of like from where you started? I mean, the story of sure. how you started with the whole just scene in, uh, England with bartending or not yeah. bartending, working in the bar On the scene. Door. Yeah. Yeah. And then getting to where you're at now, like you want to give us a quick rundown? Sure. The, um, the, the, the quick dirty version is that uh, I'm an East London whiskey drinking biker, um, born into a construction family, left school at the age of 15 um, and started uh, working on my dad's build, building site and realized there's got to be more than this. Um, and so I left, started bouncing around any job I could from working on the door, delivering cakes, door-to-door salesman, you know, anything I could get, I got. Um, and of course got fired subsequently very shortly after that. Um, and I did what every entrepreneur did. I knew I didn't fit and I was constantly, you know, striving to find where I did fit. Um, I actually went, I did a Hail Mary. I heard that there was a company in London sending stockbrokers to Hong Kong. Hmm. I actually, you know, bullshitted my way into an interview there and believe it or not, got the job. Um, they, they sent me over to uh, Hong Kong. I was there on the Saturday and Sunday partying with them, 
Monday we did orientation and Tuesday I was fired. So I'm now in I'm now in Hong Kong, no job, uh, no money, and so I went back to working on the door. So mm -hmm. I just I tried anything and I wasn't frightened of failure. I was ignorant of failure. I really didn't give a crap about it. Um, I just knew that the biggest mistake in the world, the biggest crime in the world, was to settle for where I was. And that got me bouncing off of the walls and quite simply getting into a lot of trouble as well as a youngster. And then I suddenly started to be in, a, in an area and an arena where I was seeing affluent people. Mm -hmm. And to not go on too much, they say that you are the combination of the five friends you have. Well, my five friends were, were whiskey drinking bikers and poor. And I thought to myself, well, I need rich friends. So I started befriending rich people by letting them in or telling them about better nightclubs and just kind of like trying to find a way of being a value in that life to become friends with them oh, yeah. so I could go, right, if I know 10 rich people, sure as shit, I've got to be rich. Um, and that was the, the thing behind it. It mm -hmm. went a little bit further than what I expected. And now I'm closing down museums around the planet, getting serenaded by Andrea Bocelli, walking the red carpet with Sir Elton John and knocking around with Elon Musk. So it's actually, uh, I, I, I took it way further than I ever could have visioned when I was uh, stood there on the door telling people to kind of like, keep it calm and pay their bar tab. Yeah, that's, that's crazy how that works. And do you think the whiskey had anything to do with the firings or was it something else? <laughs> Luckily... <laughs> Luckily, I'm not a. Uh, I don't get drunk very easy, and when I do, I just end up sitting down in the corner and probably just hugging someone. Um, okay. I'm not a violent drunk by any means. I can uh, tell just just talking to you. I mean, I would never. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. It's 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 funny. You you when you work on the door, you kind of start to recognize the people that get a bit feisty when they've had a couple of beers in them, oh, yeah. and you get those that just want to kind of like hug you, and they're like, "Sorry, man." And it's just it's just funny. I I think I'm the latter. I just want to sit in the corner and think I can solve the world, um, you know, with stupid ideas. So instead of complaining that, you know, you couldn't get this job, that job, that job, you took what you had, the thing that was paying you the bills, but you started finding a way around it and how you could utilize that company, the, the one you were working for, the door, by getting people in here, utilizing that business, right? Mm -hmm. For yourself. Yeah, I looked, I looked at, um, and I do now, I, lo I look at assets and I look at weakest link. Everything I go into, you see, I've never changed. I'm 53 mm. years old now. Let's be blunt. I'm okay for cash. I'm living up in the hills in Los Angeles. I'm actually doing this from a podcast full of high end motorcycles. I'm okay. But I'm still the whiskey drinking Irish kid from East London. It mm -hmm. hasn't changed. I look at something and I go, is it worth it? And what can I do with it? Where can I leverage it? What can I get out of it? And where's the weakest link? Because they say that, that that little weak link, it won't kill you until it can. And so I always look at the assets. I was working on the door and I realized I had the key to let rich people in, you know, and they would pull up in a nice car and they'd get out with our guys and they would, you know, and I don't like dicks. So if they were assholes, I wouldn't let them in, in any case. Yeah. But if they were cool caps just out to have a good time, I, I remember the first time when I tried something a little bit crazy, um, these regulars that have been coming into the club, they got out of their car mm -hmm. and they walked over and they were like, hey, Steve, how you doing? I was like, hey, boys, not tonight. And they looked at me because I was kicking them out before they even got in. And they're like, Steve, you know, and I was like, no, 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 don't get me wrong. But tonight's very quiet because there's a new club just around the corner just opened up. Everyone's in that. Mm. You come in here. You're going to hear about it, and you're going to be pissed off, you know? So I want to help you. Go around the corner, speak to Billy, tell him Sim sent you, because that's the place you want to play tonight. And they were like, dude, thank you. And so they went. Mm -hmm. My manager moaned at me because I was kicking some of our regulars away and sending them to this other club. Oh, yeah. And I said, it's a gamble, but I bet you they'd come back. And they would. The following night, they would come back, and they'd be like, is here? And I'd be like, yep. And usually when a club launches – the euphoria of the first night peters off really quickly. And then they like to go back to something that they know, you know, mm -hmm. they know the bartender, they know their favorite seat. They know where the music's not going to hit them in the ear and they can talk, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I ended up, it worked very well for us. It was a gamble, but I suddenly realized I had a value. Yeah. I had a reason for you to talk to me. And 
I exploited it. And then I quite simply, as I said before, looking at my assets, how far can I leverage this? Exactly. You know, they're talking to me now. How far can I push this? And it's like, why and, not? Why, why can't, why shouldn't you push it? Why a lot uh, of people stop themselves right away? Oh feel, my God. Feel bad it's, or... it's ridiculous. You know, you, you say to someone, Hey, what would you, what would you really like to do? And they'll turn around and they go, Oh, I'd like to play piano with Elton John, or I'd like to, you know, go kite surfing with Richard Branson, or I'd like to play on the Madison Square Garden and shoot hoops. They will tell you what they want to do within about three seconds. And then they'll spend the next two minutes going, yeah, but I don't have the money. I don't know how to do that. I don't know. They'll, they'll, give, the, they'll give themselves every roadblock. You don't even have to talk. They will just tell you all the reasons why it can't happen rather than focusing on the one reason why it should. And that's where I think my secret source when I was younger and to a great deal now mm -hmm. Was my ignorance to the failure. You know, someone says, I want to walk down the red carpet at the Oscars. All right. It's a carpet. Why can't you? And they go, Oh, but I don't know. No, no, no. You're, you're focusing on all that. Why shouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Now let's make it happen. So I was the guy that could. Um, if I may tell you another story, um, I had another group of guys come into this club in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is, is loads of harbors. Okay. And it was very affluent in the, in the uh, mid 90s. And they came into the party, and by now I was starting to get to know the people. And they turned around to me and they said, hey, Sims, are you, you going down to the yacht party tonight? Now, bear in mind, Hong Kong's surrounded by like thousands of yachts. I didn't bloody know what they were talking about. And I was like, I don't know. There's a few. Which one are you talking about? You know, I was blagging <laughs> it. I was trying to find out. Had to. So they, they told me where it is. And I said, oh, I don't know if I'm doing that one. Um, oh, I'll let you know. I said, oh, you guys going down. Then they went, oh, no, we can't. We can't get in. We don't know how to get in. I was like, oh, well. And they went into the to the club. And I was stood on the door, and I was talking to my fellow mate, Ed, and I went, hold the door for a second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bail out for a second. So I literally jumped down to the harbor. It wasn't very far away from Wang Chai, where all the clubs were. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was literally a walk. And I walked down there, and I'm walk, walking around, and I saw this boat, three-story yacht, being set up for this party tonight, and a girl in front with this flip chart. And I walked up to her, and I went, hey, how you doing? My name's Steve. Hey, I just wanted to check. Uh, we got four people coming tonight. Did you want them here at 8.30 or 9.30? You know, I know you open at 9. Uh, I don't want a bottleneck, and I don't want it kind of disturbing or disrupting you. What would be better for you? And I shut up. And she's looking at me, and she's like, uh, and then all of a sudden she does the knee jerk reaction and everyone's got a knee jerk reaction. She starts looking through the flip chart. Okay. The bearing in mind, I hadn't even given her the client's names. So I'm thinking to myself in my head, what are you looking at? You know, my, my boys aren't even in there, you know, but so, you know, I mm -hmm. just let her go, you know, let her, let her flex. And then I said, Hey, you're going to be really busy tonight. I respect that. I'm just trying to find out what would be best for you to avoid a belt bottleneck. Eight thirty. Or 9.30. And she's gone, um, 9.30. I said, thank you so much. You, you've got a big night ahead of you. You know, you're probably going to be tired. And let's be blunt. These guys and girls going into this party, they don't remember the people that actually kind of like let them in. So I want to say thank you now. And I gave her 400 bucks, 100 bucks for each person. Just want to say mm. thank you. When this is all over tomorrow night, grab yourself a bottle of wine. Put your feet up, you know, get some food and just chill that it's over. So, you know, for tonight, enjoy and thank you very much for, for helping me. And she was like, oh, thank you. And, and yeah. as I went to walk away, she went, oh, what were the names? And I gave her the names and she wrote them down on the front of the page. And I was like, you have a good time. Now, she then told me about every mm -hmm. party that was going on after that. And wow. I did the exact same. But I walked back to the club. Now, bearing in mind, I used to get paid about 800 to 1,000 bucks a week, okay? I'd just given away about 40 to 50% of my wages in that one night oh, in wow. the 90s. So this was a gamble on me. So I went back to the club, walked into the club, walked up to the boys, and I went, hey, boys, uh, I made a phone call for you. And they went, what's that? And I went, the yacht party you wanted to go to? And they went, yeah. I went, your name's on the list. In fact, it's not on the list. It's on the front of the fucking list. And they were like, oh, Stephen went, you're more than welcome. 500 bucks each. And they went, eh, and they gave me the 500 bucks. I walked out to the door and I'm thinking, 
I just made 1600 bucks by talking to someone. Wow. And I realized at that moment that the biggest thing, it was, it was, it was one of those epiphany moments. What people were really avoiding was the embarrassment of being turned away. And the more stature people get, um, whether or not it's the perception of power, the perception of money, the less they're willing to risk that by asking you if they can get in. Because if you say no, if a rich person uh, is turned away, that club will turn around and go, we're so exclusive, we turned away Brad Pitt. You know, they will use that leverage for their marketability, mm-hmm. you know, especially here in Hollywood. So people don't want to be de- denied. They don't want the humility. They don't want the embarrassment. And so having someone like me who has none of that, I became a commodity. I became a value. And then all of a sudden these guys are like, oh, Sim's got us into this party. And, you know, never was the mention of money brought up. You know, they paid, but it was – he got us in. He not only got it, us right? in, we were on the front of the damn list, you know? And all of a sudden I realized that people were very, very willing to pay to play. Mm-hmm. If they don't pay, they don't pay attention and all those other little quips. And I started. It literally started from those four guys getting on that yacht party that I then started getting them into uh, launch parties when jewelry was doing a new line, when uh, fashion houses were doing a um, – because guys love to go to like a Louis Vuitton or a Hermes or yeah. a Gucci when the it's the ladies wear because there's a lot of hot women in there spending lots of money and drinking free champagne. So I was the guy that suddenly started getting them into these things mm-hmm. and they really they really enjoyed it. So that's wow. how it started. I love that. It's such a clever way. And for everybody tuning in, listening, uh, this method, right? I'm sure me- methods just like this. And way other ones could be found in your in your book, Blue Fishing, where, oh, you, yeah. where you dive deep into exactly you know what you did and how you did it to uh, get some of these big names and how you kind of cross paths, which is uh, which is pretty crazy. Um, and like I could even relate to that. Uh, it, it's I was just at 10x. I probably shouldn't be saying this. Hope Grant Cardone doesn't listen to this. But I had <laughs> I had like a regular ticket and I left it at at my at my at my room. And I talked my way into getting into the VIP. It's got to be done. Yeah. It's got I mean, to be done. You just got to be able to uh, – Somebody, my friend was like, dude, come back, come back, come back. You're not going to get in. Like, they're so strict. And you know what? I got, I'm got. i never going to reveal the guy that got me in because, you know, he could have probably lost his job. But I got in. So it's like – it's crazy what you can do if you just put yourself out there, right? And, and I think it's that mindset, right? If you could get these other individuals to kind of believe in that moment, but then again, if 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 everybody believed in it, then you know you'd be we we wouldn't be where we're at, or you probably. Well, here's the here's the dumb thing, and I don't want to shoot myself in the foot, but nothing I do is tough. Nothing I do is difficult. You know, it only takes three seconds to chat to me to realize this is yeah. as good and as deep as I get. Um, <laughs> And so there's no miracle. There's no a case of, well, he came from a, a rich family. Oh, his family are very connected. Oh, he's this. He's that. No bullshit. I'm a biker from Britain that just happens to be doing this stuff because I know the value of communication and respecting and building relationships. And here's the dumb thing that's completely and utterly screwed up. You already knew this shit. You already knew it. When you were a child, you go to school And you play with people on the playground that resonate with you, that you like. And your parents turn around and they see Bobby or Sally in the corner and they go, why aren't you playing with Bobby? And they go, because he smells. And what do the parents do? Because I'm a parent, because I know we do it. We go, well, don't be rude. Go and play with Bobby. And we start making them get out of, okay, their comfort zone, but communicating with people they don't like. And then when they say things, when they walk down the road and they see a fat person or a bald person or someone with glasses, what do kids do? They point and they go, that man's got glasses. And we straight away turn around to the kid and we go, we don't say that. We don't talk like that. And especially now mm-hmm. in a world where we're actually scared to say shit because we're scared of getting pounced on. Ooh. Yeah. We almost want to wake up in the morning and freaking apologize for the crap we're going to say during the day in case it fucking offends someone. And that is screwing up the art of communication. And that's what's getting in the way. I had, I'm going to tell you another story if you don't mind. 
No, um, that that was great. That's like so quotable too. I don't know if you posted that up ever, but I think no. that deserves. Uh, that, wow, well, you posted up. up and we're picture of a <laughs> podcast with it. Um, I did an event in Florence, and I won't go into it too much, but I took over a museum. I had a, a, a table of six at the feet of Michelangelo's David, and I had uh, Andrea Bocelli come in and seven, eight, six people in a museum while they were eating pasta. Bingo, no, brilliant. No big deal, right? No big deal. Yeah, exactly. There was one guy in it that gave me a bit of friction about actually allowing me to do this. And I never, ever ask a question that you can answer with a yes or a no unless I'm open to that liability. Mm-hmm. I will always come to you and I will go, hey, I'd love to do something with you. What are the steps required for this to happen? Or what do we need to do to make it a win for you? Or how can this benefit you if we were to do that? I never come up and say, hey, how much is it going to cost? Or can I do this Wednesday? Okay, because you never talk about money and you never ask a yes or no question. So this guy had been giving me a bit of friction, but I'd managed to get through it. And here I am in the academia. There's the table. The guests hadn't turned up. And Andrea Bocelli's in the corner, warbling, warming up his throat. Okay. And I pulled this guy over because to be honest with you, I thought he was a dick. And I wanted to kind of like give him a little bit of uh, verbal slapping. Mm -hmm. So he came over and um, I said to him, I said, uh, you know, what do you think of the table? Now, bearing in mind, he could have said it's a pile of shit. I don't care. I'm already in. There was nothing he could do about it. My liability was zero. And he was like, uh, I won't do the Italian accent. Uh, but he said, uh, it's beautiful. I was like, yeah, it is, isn't it? I said, do you ever think that there would be a table of six at the feet of Michelangelo's David? He was like, no, I, I didn't. I said, do you ever think that someone would actually be able to pull this off? Now, again, I'm just winding him up because he annoyed me during the negotiations. Um and he's like, no, no. I said, but Andrea Bocelli's in the corner. You ever think Andrea Bocelli would actually sing to someone during that dinner? Oh, I was like, that's fantastic, isn't it? That's impressive. And my ego is just getting built. My ego is going to blow the walls off of this. And I was just, as I say, verbally slapping him just to point out that, hey, I'm in here. You try to say, you try to block it, but I got through. And mm-hmm. I, I was being a bit of an arsehole, to be completely blunt. And I thought to myself, I'm going to go for the final rub, you know? So I turned around and I went, so what made you allow it to happen? Now, I was actually communicating with his superiors. So quite simply, it was his superiors that made it happen. But I wanted to give him the last little prod to go, don't mess with me. I can get shit done. And I said to him, so what made uh, what made this happen? Or why do, why do you think this happened? Yeah. And, you know, he turned around and looked me in the eyes and he went, no one's ever asked. And I wanted to be all kind of like, there you go, screw you. I wanted him to say, because you're the most connected. You know how to communicate better than anyone, Steve. Oh, you're so holy. I wanted something like that just to piss him off. And he crumbled me within seconds with that statement. And I was like, shit. Now, he could see what I was trying to do to him. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that gave me the sucker punch. Now, I was like, Damn, you're right. And I realized, and I actually went on a quest after that. Mm-hmm. Funny enough, that guy, we went out afterwards and got drunk over a, a steak. And, you know, we've been really? good friends ever since. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it was very funny how we became very Here's close friends. He, life works. It is. He left the museum and he's now in a hotel. So we're actually good friends. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but the funny thing is I came back to L.A. from Italy. And I looked through like the last six to ten mammoth things I did. And I went in with a liability question. I went in and go, look, I know we did this, but how come we did it? And I got someone that, well, you know, you knew people and stuff like that. But it always came down to the point that no one had ever contacted us to ask. And I suddenly realized that that's sad. And you're right. If everyone did it, because people come up to me and they go, oh, you do the impossible. Thank you. Because that means you're not going to attempt it and I'm going to look brilliant. All the time you think that it can't be done. Makes me look excellent. Good on you. Okay. But the bottom line of it is nothing I do is difficult. Nothing I do is hard. But I am the Irish little kid that asks, have you got a child? Have you got kids? No, I don't. Not, not yet. You, well, <laughs> I got kids and I got three of them. Some of them I like. And here's the scoop. When they're little kids and it's coming up to dinner time, the little shits turn around, they go and get a lollipop. And they go, I want a lollipop. And you go, you can't have a lollipop. Why can't I have a lollipop? 
because you got dinner. Well, I want a lollipop, but you can't have a lollipop. Why can't I? Because I just told you, you got dinner. And you start that whole process. And in the end, you end up either yelling at the child that he can't have a lollipop or you give in and let him have the lollipop, okay? Because he doesn't have the understanding. He doesn't have the uh, the calculation in here to, to understand what you're saying. He's focused on getting what he wants. Oh, yeah. And he can't see outside of that. Any rejection is just you going, wah, wah, wah. He doesn't even, it's not even audible to him. And we de-learn it over the years. Hmm. When I got this book deal, I actually got the book deal to do a tell-all on all of the celebrities and the rich and famous and what they got up to. I was offered a very nice retainer to do a, you know, these are the famous people in the planet that Steve Sims works with and the amount of money he spends. And I said that I can't do that book because I'd be dead by cocktail hour. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I just, I just, yeah, I can't do it. And then I did a, a couple of speeches and apparently one of the people at uh, the publishing house, Simon Schuster, had seen me speak. And they actually said to me, um, instead of doing a book on who you do it for, why don't you do a book on what you do and how you do it? So now this became a helpful, a guide yeah. To helping you understand that if a brick lad from London could be doing this with a Pope, you're already out of excuses. And so when we did the book, to be blunt, I had 16 followers on Instagram. Wow. Um, I had just opened up a phone. I was a big deal to about 200 people in the world. Outside of that, no one knew who the shit I was. Um, these people just owned things like countries. So financially, I was fine. Yeah, but, it's not like I don't, it's, it didn't make or break you at that moment. No, it didn't. Yeah. It didn't. But I remember having 16 followers on Instagram and one of the girls in the uh, in the publishing house going, well, you're not credible because you've only got 16 followers on Instagram. Now, here was the dumb thing. I had just got an eight page article written on me in Forbes. So I turned around to this little girl that had basically just got above puberty and I said to her, I just got an eight-page article with me, with Richard Branson, Elon Musk, in Forbes. And she turned around to me and she said, well, are you there? Yeah, I'm so I don't know what happened. Um, and she turned around to me and she said, no one reads Forbes. And I was like, oh, God, you know, and, and that was it. So I went back and uh, I had to suddenly start doing these postings. Mm -hmm. But I thought to myself, I'm going to write the book that I want to write. And here's the dumb thing. And it really is dumb. I wanted to be put out of business. Now to be put out of business, everyone would be going and getting what they wanted. Everyone would be communicating. Everyone would be valuing the, the true ROI of a relationship. Now, while that would make me poorer, it would put me in a world that I wanted to live in because you go into a Starbucks now, and you order your, your, your chuckamucka, mulatto, double calf, whatever. And then what's the next thing that happens? Everyone steps over to the side, gets their phone out, and gets their head down. We've seen the top of people's heads way more than we've seen the color of their eyes now. And that's what's happening to our world. I heard a report the other day that mm -hmm. physically made me choke and spit out my whiskey. I heard that the average person spends more time speaking to Siri and Alexa than they do their best friend. Now, that's screwed up, isn't it? Say so what? Yep, they, because people are going into their I... home and they're going, Alexa, put the lights on, put the music on. But they'll speak to their friend maybe once a, once a week on their phone for half an hour. But every day they're sp spending 20 minutes speaking mm -hmm. to Alexa or jumping in the car, speaking to the navigation system or to, to Google Play. We're speaking to AI more times a week than we are our single best friend. I got to love our generation. I, I just got to love it. <laughs> it's uh, Well, the, the downside is that you can actually go and download an app that can teach you how to build a bridge, solve a mathematical equation, but there's not a single app out there that's going to teach you how to talk to someone. And you had it. You had it as a child. You had it when you were younger, as you were growing up. But now... My kids, and this is the dumb thing, they go and have a play date with their other, with our friends, mm -hmm. and they all take over their PlayStations or laptops, oh, wow. sit next to each other, 
with their headsets on, talking to each other through a microphone while they're all playing Fortnite, freaking next to each other. Yeah, my, my godson. I was just at his house for Christmas. I got him like this awesome bicycle, everything. And you know what? <laughs> he looked at it. He's like, oh, I think I have something like this. Picked up his phone, started playing Fortnite. Seven yeah. years old. That already. That's it. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, Now, you can criticize the kids, but the adults are just as screwed up. We spend so much time in our phones now mm-hmm. that it's just, it's just wrong. So when the book... When the book offer was given to me, yeah, quite bluntly, it was the chance of me going to Japan, buying a new motorcycle, and having a nice bit of money going to bank. It was a lovely retainer. Um, so I said yes. But not having a lot of people know me or follow me, I thought to myself, I'm going to write a book of how I want people to change. And if it does well, great. If it doesn't, I got paid. You know, my, Again, my liability was low. And I think the first month when it came out, I sold 500 copies. And then the second month, I sold 600 copies. And mm. I actually phoned up my, uh, my agent and uttered the dumbest words in the planet. Is, is this good? You know, 1,100 books. You know, is, is, that, is that good? And I was informed in no, no subtle terms, basically not to call again <laughs> and that no, this wasn't. And then the following month, I think we sold like about 900 copies. And then the following month, 14,000. So it just started to get around people. People started reading it and going, hey. And I've actually told people, and I'll tell your listeners now. Yeah. The Art of Making Things Happen, Blue Fishing by Steve Sims, it's a ripoff. Okay? It's a waste of your $16 if you buy it on Amazon. And the reason it's a waste of your money uh-huh. is because it will piss you off and aggravate you because it's stuff that you already know, mm-hmm. but your dumbass has decided that it's smarter to actually ignore it. So I'm not giving you anything in the book that you don't already know, but I'm showing you how I used it with the names that I've dropped earlier in the show. Yes. So I openly tell people it's going to aggravate you. It's going to piss you off because you already know this stuff, but you decided not to action it. Wow. So everybody, that's that's blue fishing. <laughs> He's saying not to check it out, but be sure to check it out. <laughs> um, no, I mean, that's that's just it's mind blowing where we're headed at and what we're what's happening with everything in the world. And yeah, you sort of just did like a full circle. And I'm like over here. feel I feel like I got a got a lesson, you know, not not just the listeners. I got a lesson myself. I'm like, oh, man, I'm rethinking some of the things I do with my life. But yeah. uh, kind of full circle. Going, uh, you know, kind of to wrap it up, when was that turning point though? Like, do you feel that, you know, for someone for like me, two years ago, I was miserable. I came from, a, uh, I came as an immigrant. I had to be a doctor, attorney, CPA. You know, I had to get that desk job. I became, I became an accountant and, but I hated my life, but I wasn't mm-hmm. sure. Can I handle being an entrepreneur as now I'm learning that it is not easy, you know, with, with the day to day stuff that happens. What would you tell someone like me? Uh, two years ago, that was sitting in a cubicle. Well, it's all about the friction. If what you're doing creates friction, causes aggravation, causes upset, then it's not where you should be. Um, being an entrepreneur is a license for people to screw you over, laugh at you, mock you, rip you off, uh, for you to be poor. Um, I've been I've been broke a good few times in my life. I've been screwed over. I've had contracts ripped off. Uh, I've been sued, God, a dozen times because that's what entrepreneurs get. It is not an easy ride. Mm -hmm. Um, Being an entrepreneur is like saying I'm left-handed. I've got two ears. You either are or you're not. And if you are sitting there kind of like like you, aggravated, I don't want to be here. I'm in my cubicle. This isn't right for me. It's that agitation that tells you, something's not right. I'm in the wrong hole. My peg doesn't fit. And that's when you've quite simply got to do, as I said to you earlier, bounce off the walls and try as much things as you can to find that thing that is low friction. I found for me, communication was something I was easy at. You know, as as an Irish lad, you know, maybe it's the gift of the gab, but me talking to someone doesn't create any bleed it doesn't get me punched in the head. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember when I was in in the bar, 
you know, being a young lad, I used to go feisty into a pub and, you know, someone would start fighting. I'd be like, hey, I'm going to show you that I'm the toughest. I had a friend of mine that would be, he'd talk to him and he'd walk in there and he'd walk up to him and he'd say, look, I've been asked to remove you from this club. You know, I don't want to kind of like shout at you. And he'd be very quiet. He'd whisper in their ears. I don't want to shout at you because you're going to look silly in front of your mates. You're going to come out punching. I'm going to come out punching. We're both going to get scratches. It's going to ruin both of our nights. And he'd say, so can you do me a favor? Just pay your bar tab, leave, and let's welcome you back tomorrow. Yeah, how was that? I, I saw the guy maybe in one or two fights over years. He just knew how to communicate. And I was yeah. like, damn, you know, I would end yeah. up at the end of the night, my ear, my face, my leg, my shirt had been ripped off. Oh. You know, I just thought that was what you needed. I realized from so many different places that communication is the be all and end all mm-hmm. of absolutely everything. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And I will just end it at that because <laughs> no, I mean, it's at the end of the day, it is, it's communication, it's the networks. And, um, yeah, that was, that was a lot. That was a lot, Steve. I wanted to, I appreciate that. I know the listeners are getting a lot out of that. Everybody that's at Steve Sims or Steve D Sims, the actual way to say it, Steve D Sims. Um, for me, it was just an easy way to always remember it. Um, <laughs> Steve D Sims, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, or just on his website, stevedsims.com. I've got, I've got a few more than 16 followers now, so I've done slightly better. <laughs> yeah, I think there's like, I think last was what, 18, 19? I mean, you got, uh, well, you got, you got me. Well, 18 19, including me, mum. Yeah. Yeah, you got, you got me, and I got my girlfriend to sign up. <laughs> oh, there you go. So we may be on 20 now. <laughs> yeah. But uh, now on to our listeners' favorite segment of the show welcome to the round with no name because they're all taken so the key to this is you get five seconds to initiate an answer um just Uh, want just want you to throw something out there not overthink it and otherwise my producer he lurks around in the background they call him a leg breaker like they call him the leg breaker so i don't want to have to deal with him because i like my legs so let's 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 just go quick and uh leave it at that and uh, I guess perfect way to start, based off the last answer, is entrepreneurism a fad? Uh, no, it's a, it's a fashion item that I think people use as a tagline to make them sound cool. But uh, most on, most people who call themselves entrepreneurs, um, that'll be gone by the wayside. They're all fake. I like that answer. That's actually a boss, two boss exclusive. I like <laughs> that a lot. Who has been or is? I mean, this is probably a great question for you. Your greatest mentor. Oh, God. Uh, there's been so many from yeah. Winston Churchill to Jean-Paul de Jouria, Margaret Thatcher, Joe Polish. Um, I I use my ears a lot. I realize how um, stupid I am, and I listen to absolutely everyone until I don't need to. Not just stupid, but ugly. Oh, ugly. Yes. yes. <laughs> how do you drink your coffee? Uh, in the mornings with a bit of uh, creamer and one sugar. Okay, so you're not psychotic. If, uh, <laughs> if According to a study by Huffington Post, if you drink it black, then a good chance you have some psychotic tendencies. Oh, okay. So, I remember that. So, yeah, now you know. <laughs> what is the one item that you consume every day? Could be eat, drink, or just you like need it on you, something that makes you you at one item? M- music. Oh, awesome. Specific type? No, actually, that's quite the opposite. I put everything on random. I've never played a, huh. a, a complete album, I think, in my life. I literally put everything on shuffle. I'll have Andrea Bocelli, followed by Tool, followed by Elton John, followed by Queen, followed by Limp Biscuit, Pearl Jam. I love a, a collaboration of different tunes. Some house music, too? Oh, yeah, house music. Oh, absolutely man. everything goes in there. I also, that's some awesome. of the time... I actually go onto one of my favorite apps is iTunes, and I will literally per, uh, pick World Radio mm-hmm. and just scroll down and hit. And all of a sudden, the other day, I was listening to <coughs> Indian dance from the 70s, and it nice. was just cracking me up. Nice. But now I know what it's like. So uh, there you go. Wicked, wicked. Um, so what is your favorite book? Um, 
I'm not very good with business books because I find business books aggravate me. So I end up kind of like making notes and then I'm kind of like, shit, why aren't I doing that? And so they end up fueling me. So I listen to a lot of podcasts mm -hmm. to get that information. So when I read books, I want to lose myself in fantasy. Yeah. So I love, um, I love the Dragon Tattoo books. They were actually good. Uh, the whole trilogy of those. Mm -hmm. um, I love the whole Dan Brown, uh, Inferno uh, da Vinci Code. I'm reading Origin oh, at the moment now. So I like to lose myself in uh, in fantasy books of um, discovery and yeah. maybe a detective kind of things. Oh, you're throwing some good titles there. Um, if you are stranded on an island for the unforeseeable future, what is the one item you want with you? My wife. <laughs> she won't want to be she won't want to be called an item but uh yeah just a solid answer i just got this answer uh the other day too what if it had to be an actual item like there's no people left i suppose it would have to be um music it would have to be an uh, an iphone you know or an ipod or something like that but i suppose it would have to be music okay that works if you had an unlimited amount of money right now and you could start up any business you wanted, can't be your own, what would it be? I think it would be a rescue home for dogs uh, where they don't get adopted. They just come to me and I just let them live their final days on a big ranch where they can run around and shit anywhere they like and eat and just chill. So I think I, I love adopting dogs. We've got adopted dogs. Mm -hmm. We always do it. We love yeah. it. I, yeah. I'm, I've been looking at that with, uh, with my girlfriend. Um, hopefully, uh, our next one would be like that, but, uh, that's definitely, I, I love that. Love that. Um, and then last but not least, how do you feel about socks and sandals? Um, I, I think, I think hanging them is maybe a little bit too, too vicious, but I would probably say stoning them would be, uh, would it be acceptable? So if, <laughs> if you found out, after this interview that I was wearing them the whole time during this meeting, during this. Yeah. I'm, it may, I may be tempted to throw something at you if I saw you okay. again. And if you were wearing them while you were talking to me, then, then maybe the hanging would be acceptable. <laughs> okay. okay. That, that is, that is duly noted. I will be walking <laughs> with your coffee, with your cream, and hopefully that that will suffice and you will reconsider. Okay. All right. Well, you survived. I survived. My producer, <laughs> my producer did not show up. Steve Wiley did not show up, so we're in the clear. But uh, thanks, uh, Steve Sims. Everybody, that's at Steve D Sims, Steve D Sims dot com. Check out his book, Blue Fishing. Uh, so much, there's so much content. I mean, you could go on for days. I, I've met you. I've seen you speak. I I know that there's just. <laughs> too much there. Too much for a 30, 40 minute episode. I mean, you could probably write for like 365 days straight and still probably have something to talk about. <laughs> so it's a uh, truly been a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, the mic is yours. Closing thoughts. If there's anything uh, you just kind of want to leave the listeners with, it's all yours. Yeah, I do. My dad is a big, thick Irish lad and uh, not, not the most poetic by any means. And I remember one day when I was a little kid, he didn't even look at me, but he put his hand on my shoulder as I was walking down the road. And he said, son, no one ever drowned by falling in the water. They drowned by staying there. And then he took his hands off and walked up. And as a little kid, I remember thinking, what the fuck was all that about? Um, but, you know, it served me well throughout the years. So when you've got shit you're dealing with, when you've fallen down, it's your choice whether or not you step out of it, get up or fight it. I love that. We're going to end it at that. I don't want to say anything else. Perfect. It's been a pleasure having you on, Steve. Can't wait Good to talk to you later. Help. Thanks. Bye. That is all for this episode of Boss to Boss. Your next step is to visit boss2boss.com, where you will find proven techniques followed by professionals to help you make that next step. Again, that is boss, the number two boss.com. And remember, the time is now.